All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the opportunity to join us for another round of a Fit Nation Lunch and Learn. We got an awesome program for you guys today. We're joined today uh, by my colleague, Derek, as always. But the, the real star of the show today is Bill McBride. Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Kayla. I appreciate it. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. So, Bill, I've, I've had the chance to to see you pretty much at, at, at every uh, URSA every time we go go down for the last six or seven years. And so I'm very familiar with, you know, the, the impact that you have within the industry and your experience. I've seen you speak many, many times as well. Um, but, you know, maybe for, for the people who are joining the webinar as well, we can take a little bit of time to jump into, you know, your background, uh, how you got started within within fitness and, and fitness as a career. Yeah, it's uh it's kind of a long story, Caitlin, but I'll try to be brief. Um, I uh I was a bit insecure as a kid and trying to find my way in high school and you know what I wanted to get involved with. And and the chorus teacher of the school um was my homeroom teacher. And he also happened to be the athletic trainer for the college, for the high school sports. So he was the the sports medicine guy for the school. And he said, hey, I need a student athletic trainer. We'll send you to college for weekend training over the summer. You'll, you'll go to UNC Greensboro and you'll learn about sports medicine. And, and you'll, you'll have access to every sporting event in the county. And, and you'll work with all the sports teams on first aid and, and sports medicine. And he got me excited about it. So I wound up becoming a Red Cross volunteer. I taught a fitness class for kids for the Red Cross. I taught CPR. I taught first aid. I learned sports medicine and I, and I actually lettered in athletic training my last two years of, of college. I mean, high school. That was my my letterman's jacket, which I never got a letterman's jacket, but I got my letter. My letter, I lettered in, in sports medicine, which was the first time that it occurred in my high school. Um, so I was going to go to college for sports medicine. And um, and I, I lasted about six weeks in the in the college uh, trainer's room. Uh, I just really couldn't didn't have an appetite for uh, the ego that a lot of uh, high performance athletes have with regard to, uh, you know, sports medicine, trainers, equipment guys, that kind of thing. And it just wasn't for me. So uh, my freshman year in college, English class, we had to write a resume of a job we'd like to get. And uh, my sister had a friend that managed a spa fitness center in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And so I wrote my resume to run a fitness center as a general manager. And, um, and so from my freshman year in college to, uh, to pretty much today, um, that's what I've done. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I decided that was everything I was going to do was going to be toward that goal. So I majored in business administration. I concentrated in marketing, but I took all my electives in anatomy, physiology, nutrition, um, those types of things. And, um, and basically tried to create kind of a, a health promotion degree uh, before there was such a thing. Um, so that's kind of how I got started. Um, and um, I went home that summer and went to the local spa fitness center. Um, there were two of them in town. Um, men and women went on opposite days. So Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, men went to this location. Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, women went there. And Sundays were co-ed, but the women got the one locker room. and. The other location on the other side of town had the opposite schedule. So men went one day, went, we wore smocks, and it was an interesting job because you sold the membership, took somebody through a workout, and then at the end of the night, you cleaned the facility. And we divided the facility based on the four of us. Somebody would do metal and glass because we had the universal machines. Somebody would do trash and paper, restock all the paper products. Somebody would vacuum. And we rotated the cleaning schedule, um, but uh, it was a different time back then. There was no personal trainers. There was no uh, – I'm dating myself a little bit. You know, there was no separate housekeeping staff. You, uh, you did it. You sold it. You serviced it. You cleaned it. You took care of people, and that's how we worked it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, definitely Definitely sounds, sounds different. And so as far as, you know, that, that early start, you know, obviously – uh, that that uh, I imagine it's lo looking very different in terms of where the industry was at when you first started versus 
where it's at now. Um, may, uh, maybe if you can spend a little bit of time kind of talking about those different uh, those differences, and then additionally, um, you know, for the audience members who don't who don't know you, uh, letting them a little bit, uh, letting them all know a little bit about where you are uh, today. Um, I know, you know, when I've when I've read your background, it's it's just impressive. CEO, co-founder of Active Wellness, and so so much more. You sit on on the advisory board of many organizations. So, what a what a difference between going from a club manager early to having all of these accolades. So, it's impressive. Well, you know, I um, it's interesting because early in my career, people would say, you know, when are you going to get a real job? Um, mm. And um, and my mom was uh, my mom was always my biggest. Um, brainwasher uh, fan, and she would, you know, she would say, hey, "You having fun? Yeah. Um, you're making a little bit of money. Can you pay your bills? Yeah. Then follow your heart, you know." And so I'm a big believer in that old cliche, you know, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Um, even the worst of times in my career um, have been fulfilling and rewarding, and um, and so I don't have any regrets about you know the path. Um, so I think what's changed is we went from a very generalist perspective, just like all immature industries do, to more specialization. When I first started out, the gyms I worked in were very small. Um, the cardio was four Monarch bikes. Um, that's not an electronic deal, you know, before the life cycle was invented. Um, you know, we had universal machines with five or six stations around one square rack. You know, um, this was all before selectorized and Nautilus was the big selectorized equipment that came out with the Nautilus cam. You know, so I've kind of seen it go from um, very early to much more specialized and much more professionalized. You know, in the beginning, it was it was mostly all uh, mom and pop and independent operators uh, and Bally and Scandinavian and some of those big groups came in and and. Um, different names, presidents and first lady and, and you know, different names along the way. But we went from general to more specialized to extremely specialized. And, um, you know, that has its benefits. We got very good at exercise physiology. We got really good at, at sports specific training. We got really good at uh, professionalized group fitness. Um, but we also created some silos where we had different departments doing their own thing not having an integrated approach sometimes for the member solution. So, um, so I think a lot's changed with generalization to specialization and a lot more in the professionalization, professionalization of our industry. Um, yeah, super, super interesting. And, you know, er earlier, you know, as you were talking, you mentioned that you made a, you, you've had some down points within your career as well. And if it's okay with you, I'd love to, to, to talk about that and see how that's, how that's, how that shaped you and, you know, what were some of the learnings from this? So what would, what would you say would, would be some of the biggest mistakes that you've made early in your career so that some of the people who are, are, you know, just getting started can avoid some of those potholes, you know, what were the learnings that you had from that? Yeah, I think one of the big ones is um, becoming a club manager or supervisor or whatever the, the role is when you're young and in the beginning of your career. Um, my tendency was, oh, I'm X. I'm in charge of this. That means I need to have all the answers. That means I need to know what's going on and what I'm doing. And, and, um, and if you think that you have all the answers at any stage in your career, you are sadly mistaken and causing yourself a major disservice. Um, so one of the early mistakes I made was, was based on insecurity and a concept of thinking I had the an had to have the answers. I didn't solicit help when I needed it. I didn't solicit collaboration when I should have. Um, I, um, you know, I, uh, you know, faked it till I made it kind of thing. You know, I pretended like I had it all figured out. And and so, you know, one of the key things in leadership is being vulnerable at times and saying, "Hey, you know what? I don't know what we should do here. What do you guys think?" Or I know I want to get here, but I don't know how we're going to get there. How can we get there? And, you know, um, collaboration and having a, you know, a, a horizontal leadership style versus a vertical leadership style. You know, I want all of my team members to uh, to tell me, you know, what my idea, why my idea is not so great, how to make my idea better. 
or or if we should abandon my idea and do somebody else's idea. So collaboration, horizontal leadership, you don't have to have all the answers. You have to you should focus on having the right questions and working together to get the answers. So that was that was one. And the other thing just early on, um, you know, we, we spend so much time with our staffs uh, and team members that we become very close friends. And um, just remembering at the end of the day, um, there's an employer employee relationship and it's harder to manage your buddy than it is to manage an employee. Um, so understanding that there are boundaries in our family of teamwork within within our, our facilities, you know, that have to be respected um, and just making sure that you don't uh, cross those lines with regard to making yourself ineffective as a manager. Um, so those are two, you know, early professional lessons that that I wish I'd have known what I know now then with regard to um, I'd have been more productive and got more results, you know, out of out of what we were trying to accomplish. Yeah, that those are those are big, and maybe we can jump into it a little bit. Honestly, even for my own personal curiosity, because I I jump into those, uh, I make those same mistakes all the time too. And you know, when you were talking about, you know, the the need, like there's a feeling that you need to have the answer, but you also have to incorporate the t- the team. Sometimes I, I personally feel like those things are are competing forces to where you want to be able to, to provide the answer or at least a framework in order to find an answer, but also kind of manage giving, giving people the freedom to be able to help be empowered within their role itself. And like I said, they feel opposed at certain times. What what tips would you give a a leader to kind of juggle that? Yeah, I think um, so that you're, you're totally right, Kaylin. That's a, that's a great, uh, That's a great observation. There's a difference between having all the answers and being a force of optimism. Um, For example, Colin Powell, one of my heroes, did a leadership, um, you know, speaking tour after he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff before he became secretary of state. And he talks about all these tenets of leadership. And one of them is uh, perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. Okay, that's one of his tenets. And and so situation in Crystal City, Virginia, Arlington, Virginia, I was managing a club that had a big, uh, a big contract with the uh, it it was it was with the Navy and Air Force combined. It was a combined um, Army Air Force, uh, Navy Air Force um, uh, corporate membership program. And these guys were outplaced from and gals were outplaced from the Pentagon. Um, into Crystal City, into the office buildings. Okay, so you had um, male and female uh, soldiers, officers, um, contractors, all a part of of NAVC and NAVAIR. And so um, they all pulled out of Crystal City to go back to the Pentagon, leaving a ton of vacancy in my immediate market. So the health club was in the basement of these towers, and if you know Crystal City, there's a big underground that connects the two sides of the city with all kinds of office space and retail. So the health club was in the basement of, of this of these these towers. So losing, we lost like 400, 500 members kind of overnight, and we we didn't have that many members to lose. It was a very devastating blow to to the production of the club and the morale of the team. Um, and so I had no idea how we were going to backfill those members, get new members to replace those and grow the business. I had no idea how we were going to do it, but I knew we were going to do it. And so through intentionality, guys, we're going to do this. Whoever comes in will be able to pay more money because that contract was so low. So even if we get a third of the members back at the normal rates, we'll be better off than we were. We're going to get this back within 12 months. You don't need to worry about it. We're going to make that happen. And so I didn't have the answer, but I had the intention and the optimism. So people felt comfortable that we were going to figure it out. They weren't freaking out. They weren't panicking. Um, and together we came up with some cool strategies and tenants came in and, and we, were, we, were, we were double the number in revenue than we were on the losses within a year. So you don't have to necessarily have the answers to still be an optimistic, intentional leader. So you can build confidence that things are going to be okay, 
even though I don't know how we're going to do it. I just know we're going to do it, you know, and it's that thing about I'll bet on this team against any other team. Um, I don't care what game we're playing because we have a culture, we have talent, we have uh, synergy with how we work together. We have trust, we have respect, you know, so we can figure things out. And, And so I think the, the, the perpetual optimism is, a, is, is, is the way to be focused versus having all the answers. Wow. Yeah, that, that's huge. And, and what, a, what a learning that can, comes from, from, a, from a mistake. And I'm sure you know, that people are, who are, are listening will be able to take an element of that and incorporate it right away. And thank you for sharing that. Is, maybe we can switch gears, though, and, and, and talk about uh, accomplishments. So in, obviously, you know, from from what everybody can see when they look you up, you have a very decorated uh, career and have done done a lot. Uh, and so, as as far as you know, what what makes you the most proud? What what would you say would you would personally say would be is your is your biggest accomplishment? Um, it's a great question. I you know it. Um, I set goals. And I achieved those goals. Um, and I, um, but I did it based on what I'll call not giving up versus based on some extreme level of talent. Um, so, for example, my mother was a real estate agent. And so when I was 17, I said, I want to get my real estate license. So, I, um, I studied for the real estate exam um, and uh, you had to be 18 to take the exam. So I went to the course when I was 17. I studied. By the time I turned 18, they had changed the format a little bit of the exam, but it was the same content. I should have passed it. I failed the exam. Um, I studied again. I took the exam again. I failed the exam. I'm never going to go into real estate. Wasn't my goal. I was just doing it as a 17 year old kid because his mom was in real estate as a kid. But now I failed it twice. I took the exam the third time. I passed the exam. To this day, I have a, a broker's real estate license on inactive status in the state of North Carolina. Okay. So I don't like failing the exam. Um, you know, I wanted to be a C-level health club executive of a significant health club company by the age of 40. That was just a random goal. Didn't mean anything. I got lucky and got to that goal at the age of 41. Um, I think I applied to be on the URSA board of directors maybe four or five, five times. And never got accepted on the URSA board of directors. On the fifth or sixth time, whatever it was. I got accepted on the URSA board of directors and became the chairman of, of the URSA board. So um, I just never give up on something that I set as a goal. Um, but I also don't view myself as overly ambitious, you know, t- to an extreme um, or even overly competitive. I just, um, I just don't like to disappoint myself. Um, and, um, you know, I'm playing to that audience of one, you know, what makes me feel good about me. And um, so none of that's meant in any kind of hubris. It's more, none of those goals even are, you know, maybe earth shattering. You know, the message I would like to leave is if you set a goal that's important to you, no matter what it is, um, you know, keep going. Don't don't give up um, unless you change your goal and go, you know what? That was a goofy goal. I'm okay not doing that one because that's not really what I want to do. But if it's a goal that was meaningful and is still meaningful, um, keep getting up, keep going for it. Um, you know, and and it, I mean, I've had some some goals that you know, even those the, those goals might not be earth shattering. I've had a lot of goals that were a lot were a lot smaller than that. You know, that uh, that you know, without without setting a course of where you want to go, you're not going to get there, and that's. That was the biggest lesson I learned in that English class in freshman English in college was once I set that goal, I had a, I had something to work toward. Um, once I decided that I wanted to be a, an executive 
in health club management, I did some things that I wouldn't have done if I just had a job in health clubs. For example, I went from being a general manager to selling corporate memberships. Um, it was a it was a backwards role from a position standpoint, but I felt it was important for me to know how to sell corporate memberships and wellness. So I spent two years selling corporate membership instead of managing clubs to learn how to do that skill set because I felt that would be important for my longer goal. So playing the long game and not the short game, um, when I went from managing one club to two, I thought this will be great. My boss is going to give me twice my salary because I'm doing two clubs instead of one. He gave me $4,000 raise to run two clubs instead of one and told me that uh, I'll be lucky to have this valuable lesson. And he was right. Um, uh, Mitch Wall, one of my early mentors, you know, so running two health clubs is one of the hardest jobs in our industry. You know, if you're a really great general manager, you're working 50 to 60 hours a week. If you're running two clubs, even at 60 hours, that's only 30 hours each club. Both clubs look at you as part time. So, you know, learning how to delegate, learning how to uh, how to hire great people because you just simply can't be there. So that job of managing two facilities at the same time taught me how to trust other people and how to develop other people and how to hire other people that were better than me in many ways so that I could expand the footprint. And um, and that's one of the one of the biggest things that that is is a growth opportunity for us is hire people that are better than you in areas that you're not the best in because they will not typically push you out of the way. They will typically push you upwards. Um, yeah, there was, there was so much in there that I want to, I want to jump into. And maybe I think right. like, this is, a, right. this is actually a, a perfect time to, to, to segment into a, a part that we have that's called the operations deep dive, where we can, we can go into one of these things uh, in specific or something else. So uh, yeah. So in there, you were talking up, talking about so much. I mean, the, uh, and before that as well, you were talking about how to be able to uh, make sure that you're able to ha have a great employer employee uh, relationship so that this way you're focused on building a culture that's that's great and happy but also to be able to make sure that you're getting results and and people aren't slacking so there's so many ways that we can take this but i'll i'll, I'll leave it to leave it to you um as far as what maybe story that we can d dive into that you know you can talk about either an opportunity that that you saw a goal that you set for yourself and share some details on how you set out in order to, to accomplish that uh, and or potentially the other side of the coin where there was a there was a uh, a challenge that you were you were facing and what was the process that you took in order to be able to go out and uh, and hit that uh, and address that challenge such as the story you were telling about running two clubs <laughs> as well uh, you know it's um when we formed active wellness um it's um, so it was on the, the framework of a company called Club One. So there was an organization called Club One that I had worked with and my two partners had worked with in, in previous times. But I had worked with them um, up until about a year before they they were not going to make it. And, uh, and I separated from the organization based on just the board wanted to go in a different direction with strategy. And I recommended that that might not be the the best strategy. And, um, and we separated, um, on their impetus, but very amicably, um, about nine months later or so we saw that they were getting in trouble. Um, and we put together a group, my partner, Jill Kenny, um, put together a group, um, uh, and my partner, Carrie White with I, but, but Jill put together the, the investment group. And we went in and, and purchased the assets of club one, um, before they, before they really were not going to be a go forward enterprise anymore. So basically what we bought from them was simply some used equipment, the ability to go to all the landlords and see if they would let us stay on with lease assignments and the ability to go to all of our management contracts and see if they would keep us on as the management company. So we bought really an opportunity. We didn't buy for sure leases and we didn't buy for sure management contracts. So we had to call every one of those clients and landlords and negotiate 
us staying on in the location so the sites wouldn't go dark. Um, and, um, and, you know, so when I called the clients, I would say, listen, let us manage the property for 90 days as is. And if you don't like our service within 90 days, you can cancel it. But at least that way you'll have a transition period and it won't go dark and, you know, no, somebody will be there tomorrow morning kind of thing. And, um, and, the, and it was unbelievable the retention rate we had. Um, we had, uh, we had one client that, that we decided to part ways with, and we had one landlord that, that caused us some, some, um, some legal wrangling. Um, but, but we, we basically just did it with communication and transparency and, uh, opportunity. Um, and so picking up the phone and just talking to people. And being direct and saying, here's what we can do. Here's how we got into this situation. Here's our plan. We'd like to do this with you. And, and we're not holding you hostage and we're not, you know, forcing you. We're, we're, we're doing it. You know, I'm a big Stephen Covey fan. We're doing it from a win-win perspective. So, you know, that would kind of be a very condensed version of the story. Um, over that period of time, we, we closed all the clubs that we, we owned because we were pivoting to be a professional services management company today, active wellness um, when we're fully operational opening has 1100 employees in, um, in um, I believe we're in um, 11 States at this point, plus Canada. Um, and we have over 50 sites that we manage throughout the U S. So, you know, we have a very tight business model. We do corporate fitness. We do multi-tenant fitness. We do commercial health club management. We have a brand called Active Sports Clubs. We manage medical wellness centers. We have an investment and a partnership with Providence St. St. Joseph Healthcare. Um, they manage some of their properties. So, so we've really built um, a nice company that's focused on high standards, quality of care, and, um, and teamwork, you know, with our employees around the, around the country. So that would kind of be a, a deep dive on, you know, taking things one step at a time, laying out the whole strategy and the whole process, and then working the plan. Awesome. Yeah, I, I feel like I've been, uh, I've been, uh, taking on a lot of the, a lot of the questions right now. And I know Derek has, uh, has some some questions as well that that he well, would like to get through as well. So I can turn it over to Derek as as well in order to to jump in. Thanks, Dan. Hi, Derek. Yeah, excellent. So so Bill, you kind of got up. Hey, how's it going? You kind of got up to this section just kind of in your your last statement. Active wellness is is very much involved in many different kind of sub industries within within health and wellness. You'd mentioned corporate wellness, medical fitness, sports complex, commercial, etc. Um, I'd like to get a little bit of a, a futuristic view. I guess this is not just for active wellness, but but you in general, where you see the industry going, and is there any kind of part of that industry where you're maybe itching to to get active wellness involved in that as well to expand. Yeah, I mean, um, Derek, I'm going to take it a little broader, just in the sense of um, our industry's done a lot to avoid being regulated or licensed, right? Um, when AEDs came out, our industry was like, ah, should we, should we make people have AEDs in our health clubs? That's government interference. That's government regulation. We've done a lot as an industry to fight and avoid somebody else telling us what to do. Um. And so um, that serves us well in some ways, but it, it also can hurt us in other ways because we now have an issue with credibility. You know, um, nail salons, hair salons, you know, they got open quicker than we did in most locations because they're regulated and they're licensed and they're inspected. And, and so, um, you know, I, I, I sometimes worry that not having us at the highest level of standards um, can cause us a lot, a lack of credibility with the consumer. Um, so I think that the cleanliness, the sanitation, the focus on safety, the importance of medical integrated programming, the importance of protocols on how to handle things, I think that's more important than ever for the consumer 
and legislators and the media to have respect and and for our industry and, and, and credibility. You know, I spent two years with the American Council on Exercise on their industry advisory panel. I'm a contributing editor for the American College of Sports Medicine on the fifth edition, the latest edition of the Facilities and Standards Guideline text. You know, so I'm a big believer that if we're going to self-regulate, we need to raise our game on the standards that we hold ourselves accountable to. And, um, and it might not even be bad, you know, to have a little bit of, of, of um, baseline um, guidance um, to give our industry more credibility. So um, I kind of I think I hit your question a little bit, but you can drive, dive in deeper if I missed miss, miss some of it there. No, that's that's great. We'll get into to more of it with some of the the follow up questions. I think coming back to a few of the the previous things you had mentioned about you know going from a, you know generalist to specialist in in any industry, you've clearly branched into specific focus areas. And I know I've had the pleasure of working with with some of your teams. So you mentioned about hey, one of the biggest accomplishments is making sure you have that top notch team with you as well. So you know working with them. I also am pretty well uh, in depth with your kind of your, the corporate aspect of it. And I did not know about uh, you selling corporate memberships, which is actually kind of cool to, to hear now, to hear that passion stems from a long time ago. But one of the trends we're seeing is mental health. And this actually comes from a, a question from our audience. But I think it's not just for corporate, but in general, do you see some kind of opportunity to kind of combine fitness and mental in corporate and then basically the industry in general? Yeah. No, excellent question, Derek. I'm very passionate about this. Um, when, uh, when I look at personal training, um, you know, what do you pay for when you buy a personal training session? You know, you're paying for what? A lot of people say outcomes. A lot of people say now you're paying for supervision and accountability. Um, I think you're also paying for uh, social companionship. Um, a lot of our seniors in a lot of our clubs do personal training. Yeah, they want to get fit. They want to be healthier. They want to have better core balance. They want to not fall. They want to have more stamina. But they love that social interaction with their trainer. So, so I think that there's, there's physical, there's social, and then there's mental. And, um, and I don't know anybody – that doesn't struggle with mental health or mental wellness at some point in their life. And it could be as easy as insomnia and stress to severe anxiety, to depression, to feelings of isolation, to suicidal thoughts. Um, unfortunately, I mean, so there's this continuum of mental wellness and I'll call it mental wellness versus mental health. Um, that our industry can play such a big role in. And we may have taken some of that for granted. I'll speak for myself. Um, but we're hearing, you know, through this COVID-19, oh my God, I need to be back at my club because of how it makes me feel, even though we can exercise on our own, right? We're social creatures and we tend to want variety with regard to um, things that keep us stimulated mentally. Uh, so I think with the opioid use, the increased alcohol, alcohol use, the increased suicide rate, depression, isolation, hostility and aggression. I mean, people are acting really crazy out there. You know, you're hearing stories of people getting in fistfights because somebody got too close to them without their mask on or somebody shooting somebody because they didn't like the way they were told to wear their mask. Um, you're seeing these outbursts of aggression and hostility because people are, are worked up. They're mentally, you know, in a state of anxiety and, you know, um, fight or flight. Right. And, and so, um, so I think that we, we need to really hone in on mental wellness is one of the things that we can do. That's not as easy to do on a soul cycle bike at home or a Peloton bike or, you know, a treadmill at your house, which I think are all of those products are fantastic and great, but we can provide social energy, social positivity, emotional support and mental wellness. 
And I think that needs to be part of our programming, part of our training, part of our culture, part of our storytelling, part of our marketing. Um, so I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I think this is uh, this is not only a, a big opportunity, um, but it's it's so necessary for our industry to step up on mental wellness right now. You actually already went ahead and answered my, my follow-up question. Just to repeat it to make sure I understood it correctly is – you kind of mentioned this in your man mentality about, you know, keep calm and cool, understanding that there's going to be obstacles along the way to get to a goal. So I think a lot of people may see trends, but maybe a little bit hesitant or, or scared to, to go all in and pursue them. So my question was going to be, how do you recommend they start even just moving in that direction? And if I understood you correctly, Bill, one of the powerful ways is, you know, starting internally with, with your staff, making sure they're educated on the topic, make sure you're including that in some of the internal things, uh, such as the, the culture, et cetera. So when you do decide to make maybe a more drastic move into the area, you already have that kind of foundation set up. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's right. I think, you know, some of it is how we hire people, you know, um, do you hire people that have psychology backgrounds? You know, do you hire Trainers that also have certifications in health coaching. You know, do you bring in experts to help educate and train your staff on? Um, and I'm not talking about getting out of our lane and being counselors or mental health professionals. I'm talking about being health coaches, um, supporting fitness professionals. Um, and if you do get out of your lane with counselors and mental health professionals, having that set up as a separate practice you know, with those professionals that are doing what they do. And, um, you know, and I also think that there's nothing wrong with people that need medication for mental health. And, and so medication with exercise and activity is the best combination. So, you know, we still want to make sure we're non-judgmental on, on, medication and all those other things. There is, should be no stigma to mental illness. It's just like any other illness. And so, um, but staying in your lane, but also thinking more like I have to support this person emotionally, mentally, um, psychologically, uh, you know, so they feel good, you know, um, do we measure happiness as a, as a, as a metric of our membership, a member experience, you know, how happy are our members? Um, you know, if, if I'm happy, you know, um, I'm going to feel better. And if I feel better, I'm going to get better results. And, and even if I don't get, you know, the weight loss I was looking for, if I feel better and I'm happier, that's a win. Um, Absolutely. You know, so, so, uh, so, you know, and, and so to your point about trends, there's fads, right? A fad is something that's flash in the pan. It's here and it's gone. Then there's trends that currently are moving and they have some sustainability. And then there's practices, right? Things that people practice to master, right? Yoga is a practice. People practice the, 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 the art and skill of yoga. People practice martial arts. Um, People are avid cyclists. People, you know, are avid mountain climbers. These are things people do as a as a practice. Um, so, you know, understanding, you know, what's a trend, what's a fad, and what's a practice, and how you're going to offer those things, and how you're going to move down those different paths. Cool. I think I have one last question for you before I pass it back to to Kaylin. But I guess you would describe this as a fad, as basically something that's short term. Do you think there's something, and you've taken advantage of many trends over over the years, getting into the corporate space, medical space, from from my opinion, before others went into that area. So I think in many ways you're kind of, um, you know one of the, the leaders or front runners in many ways in, in some part of these, these new trends. And I think that's a big contributor to your success, but related to those fads, is there something that's currently like a trend right now that you're a bit skeptical of, or, or you think's overrated at the moment? So you don't necessarily have that itch to move in that direction. Um, I think that, you know, to, to piggyback on my buddy, Blair McKinney, 
I think cleanliness and safety are going to be core competencies that people will look at forever. But I think that um, we had a, a, a pendulum swing way to the to side on the on the contact surface cleaning. Um, we've always been known as clean facilities. And originally we were told that we got to clean all the contact services. You know, very few viruses are spread now based on the contact service research that they're sharing now. Most of it's the droplets in the air. Um, so I'm not sure how, how stringent the, the electronic spares and, and the, 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 the deep, deep cleaning consistently. I'm not sure if that's going to stay forever now. Or if that's going to just go through um, through the pandemic period, um, so I'm not sure if the overabundance of hard surface cleaning is a fad or a trend. Um, but right now, it's it's necessary and important. Um, the overall issue there for me is safety, commitment to safety, and what does that mean based on the circumstance, right? Um, so you know that's one thing I think. What came out of this is the importance of ventilation in our facilities. Health club ventilation systems tend to be better than most any other retail based on the number of bodies, based on clubs that have humidity with their wet areas. So um, really designing for spa spatial distancing on new facilities, really designing for uh, max capacity air exchanges on your HVAC and filtration. Um, you know, so, you know, how you configure locker rooms, how you configure sink areas, how you configure um, passage areas where people come past each other. You know, I think you're going to see some things change with design of facilities to accommodate not only more social distancing in space, but also more semi privacy. You know, some research that was done by, I believe, uh, um, one of the, the, the senior uh, associations. Um, you know, talks about how seniors want a little more semi-privacy in the locker rooms. You know, they don't want to be in this alley of lockers on both sides and everybody seeing them. You know, they want a little bit more, you know, semi-privacy. So I think spatial safety um, right now, you know, there's a lot with disinfectant, sanitation and cleanliness. Um, but um, but I think the key is how do we raise the game on how we're perceived by the media and by the government and by the community that we're a viable continuum. You know, there's fitness, there's wellness, and there's medical integration. And we're part of that continuum. And, um, and then a lot of people go, no, gyms are all the same. They're sweaty areas that are dirty, right? And so there's, there's a difference between, you know, a dirty, not well-managed gym and a quality operator that's, uh, that's committed to, to safety and doing it right. Um, I, I would like to, uh, well, I'll come back around with Caitlin on, on something I want to revisit about my team, but, but how's that Derek? Does that answer it a little bit? Yeah, that's great. And I'm not sure if you'd like to bring up your you're going to mention with the, the team, feel free. I don't know exactly um, if maybe now is a good time for that Caitlin or uh, best to go through the questions. Yeah, feel feel free and feel free and uh, and hit it, Bill. If you think now now is good timing, I just think that you know um, it's easy for me as the CEO of Active to tell you you know all these great things that that we do as an organization and all that. Um, it's just disingenuous because um, I don't do very much personally. Um, it's my team, and I've got a core group of people that have been with me. Some of them have been with me when I worked at Sport and Health on the East Coast and worked with me at Club One and, and active here on the West Coast. So um, my core team of people um, are the ones that that make everything happen. Um, you know, I've got an amazing, you know, chief operating officer in Michelle Wong, um, Carrie Bedgood, my, my chief marketing officer, Mike Rucker, my chief technology officer. Uh, Meredith Persia heads up all of our, our human resources. Um, my partners, Carrie White, runs our technology and, and, and finances. My other partners are chairman of our board and brings in you know, new business development, Jill Kenny. And so you're only as good as the people that you surround yourself with. And, um, and, and below, or not even below, because we don't have a above and below culture, but even everyone else, Deb Heiser running 
our East Coast. Marsha Frank's running our West Coast, you know, as directors. Um, you know, Justin Honeth running, you know, all of our projects and procurement. Shauna DeShaggio. Anyway, I go through the list of, of people. And um, so if, if I were advising somebody in the industry starting out, it would be hire the best people you can. And by that, I mean the people that have the right attitude and the right culture. You can train most people to do most things, um, but really spend your time hiring and, and to ensure greater diversity, have multiple people in the interview process. Um, you know, we, we, we tend to hire people that are the same age as us or the same um, interests as us and those kinds of things. So it's very important to have a hiring system where multiple people are involved in the hiring process to increase um, the talent pool and, uh, and diversity that we get. So I just really think that human resources um, is a big, big, big deal for our industry um, because, you know, you can't get anything done without people. And, uh, and I'm just really proud of, of our people. And I want to make sure that you guys know that they're the ones that make it happen. <laughs> Yeah, that that that's huge, and I think for from basically everybody who we've we've spoken to and had the chance in order to talk to is who's who's uh, achieved you know great things will always uh, say that it's important in order to surround yourself with people who who inspire you, attract good people uh, on your team. Um, uh, there's obviously you know a lot of uh, popular uh, books out there that will talk about how. For you as a professional, you're you're the average of the five people that that you surround yourself with, and I think I've seen that in 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 many books. And so, I think you know as you were as you were t uh, talking, you know, uh, you've mentioned a lot of people who that that you have within your network who and, are and, and Annette Co who runs our finance department. Annette Co is our vice president of finance. So I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. And yeah, I mean, you, you, you've named a lot of people who that uh, on your team who, who are inspiring in some way. You know, if you were to reflect on on your career and professionalism and, and maybe life, you know, is there, is there, you know, maybe somebody that you uh, or a group of people that you look to as as mentors or people that you look to for inspiration? Maybe you know, professional board of advisors for yourself as a as a profession uh, professional personally. Yeah, I'm a big believer in mentors. Um, and, um, you know, um, I, I, one of my mentors, I used to always just thank him so much for being my mentor. And his response was always the, the student shows up to the teacher. It's not necessarily the teacher finding the student. So find mentors. You know, I had a mentor in my first club um, who taught me how to sell when I was very young and how to be of service mind and how to care, you know, how to, how to create a caring environment. I had a, a you know, another mentor in Mitch Wald who, you know, taught me a lot about uh, business and, and communication and hiring people and letting them do the job, you know, giving them, you know, if you give somebody, if you give somebody responsibility for something, you got to give them authority for something. You can't give people responsibility mm -hmm. for something and not give them the authority. So, um, so find mentors. You can find mentors that are real live people and you can find mentor, you know, thoughts with people like I've found, I view Colin Powell as a mentor. He's never met me. Um, but he sure has taught me a lot, you know? Um, and, um, and so join, you know, join a round table for peer group mentorship, you know, um, I'm involved with uh, with Rex. Um, I used to be involved with Faust, but find people to network with. Uh, find people that can that can mentor you, and then help mentor other people. There's there's nothing like doing something for somebody that can't do anything for you. You know, if I'm having a bad day, the best way for me to get it, get in a better mood is to help somebody else. Um, so you know, whatever you try to teach, you'll get better at. You know, so put yourself out there and and um, and help other people and find people that uh, that can help you. You know, yep, huge. And and as far as you know, let's uh, we have 
we have new business owners who are on this as well, who haven't heard of, you know, the different areas that they're able to turn to in order to be able to surround themselves with, uh, with these people who they can learn from and, and find, find mentors, uh, as well. So for some of, some of the, the, the new owners and that who are just getting, uh, getting into it, what would be, you know, advice as far as, uh, professional associations that you would recommend or groups that they can find people to, uh, to bounce their ideas off of and learn from? Yeah, there's so many, um, there's so many associations, you know, I, I would, um, I would do a lot with URSA, um, on education. I would do a lot with club solutions and club industry on education. If you're in a sector that, that deals with, um, parks and recs, you know, um, NURSA, if you're in a sector that deals with seniors, you know, the International uh, Council of Active Aging. Um, but I, I would get involved with the trade associations from an educational standpoint. Um, Rex Roundtables has roundtables for all types of positions in our industry. Um, there's Vistage tables that are outside of our industry. Um, but creating, you know, a network of colleagues that you can count on and, and bounce ideas and share best practices with. Um, you know, but taking advantage of education, Facebook, LinkedIn, I'm a big LinkedIn user, you know, joining groups within those platforms and leveraging those groups, um, you know, can be beneficial and helpful. Awesome. And then kind of going back to, you know, uh, having mentors and, and people that you, you, uh, that you, uh, look up to, you know, what was, what was some of the best advice that you've, uh, you've ever received from, from your mentors and, and maybe from the other side as well. So as a mentor, you know, what was maybe one of the most impactful advice that you've ever given to a team member? Um, learn how to take feedback well. Um, Mitch Wald once, um, he would, if he got a, a letter from a member that was not such a nice letter and you were the manager of a club, he would make you write the response, but it would be for under his name, right? So, because he got the letter, so he had to respond to the letter. But he would have you write the letter. So I got one of these letters, and I had to write the response. And I wrote the response, and, and Mitch brought me in and went over my letter and, and basically said, you know, I found something you're not really that great at. You're not really that great at, at business letter writing. And, um, and he corrected my letter and gave me feedback. Um, and you know what I did? I went out and took a weekend business writing course. So I took a Saturday, Sunday weekend business writing course. I don't know. It was $149 or something. It was very cheap. And I, I practiced writing business letters. Okay. So I wasn't good at it. I got some training in it. I got some coaching in it and I practiced it. Um, the first couple of years of my career, I was very uncomfortable um, at public speaking. Um, I'm not saying I'm any good at it now, but I'm more comfortable with it now. But I did it by practicing and putting myself out there. You know, I first spoke at MACMA, the Mid-Atlantic Club Management Association. Then I spoke at Club Industry. Then I tried to speak at URSA. And so I put myself out there to learn how to write business letters. I put myself out there to learn how to publicly speak in a better way. Um, so when you find something that you think is important for your success and you're not good at it, take that as an opportunity to welcome the feedback, welcome the criticism and try and improve upon it. You know, don't go, you know, kill the messenger or don't go, Oh, that's not an important skill set. I don't need to do that. You know, so be open to feedback. It would be what I'd say. Cause if you're open to feedback, you'll, you'll get better quicker. Yeah, that's huge. And I, I think you gave two amazing nuggets in, in that as well, which is, you know, one, be open to the feedback and, and learn from it. But the other thing from, from your story as well is that you not only learn from it quickly, but you also apply those learnings quickly as well. And I, I think that's another huge piece for people as well as making sure that they put themselves in a position to where if you're learning and you're reading these books, you're taking these classes and seminars, put yourself uh, in vulnerable positions in order to be able to apply that learning as well. And that was super apparent in your, in your story. And then as far as the other side of it, you know, is there a moment that, you know, maybe somebody has come to you and, and has said, you know, this was some of the best advice that, you know, I've ever been given within my uh, career and it changed the way that I, 
I am as a professional? Yeah, I think um, from a practicality standpoint, um, if you're gonna, if you're, if you're not happy with your job, and you're looking for another job, and you go out and find another job. Don't accept the new job until you talk to your current employer. Um, your current employer may say, go for it. I think that's an amazing opportunity for you. Or they may say, you know, we had some things planned that we couldn't tell you about yet. And um, you might want to stick around. Right. So once you once you accept another job and resign, most of uh, most employers are going to say, good luck. Thank you for your service and wish you well. But if you come in and say, listen, I have an opportunity, but I don't want to accept it until I really talk it through with you and talk through my future. Because as much as an employer loves and wants to be there for every one of their employees all the time, you, you sometimes don't talk to every employee about some of the things you're thinking about with regard to their future. Um, for example, I went to resign from my mentor to take another job, which happened to be with somebody he knew and respected. And he gave me this advice, you know, don't, don't ever do that again. Don't resign. And because you don't know what you don't know with regard to, and they were doing some interesting things and he talked me out of leaving by sharing with me, but it was much more awkward because I had already um, accepted a role. So never accept a role until you've talked to your current employer, if you're happy with your current employer and the relationship. So, um, because once you accept and resign, most people are gonna say, thank you very much, good luck to you. Um, so one piece of advice would be, hey, I want some advice. I want to talk to you about my career. I've got an opportunity, but before accepting it, I want to talk to you. Um, I think that would open up a lot more opportunities for people. Um, keeping your resume up to date, at least every year. Um, if for no other reason for you to be able to keep measuring and logging your progression in your career and making sure that you're continuously getting better. So even if you're not looking for a job, keeping your resume up to date. Awesome. And I, I think we have a, uh, a little bit of time in order to hit a couple audience questions that, that came through as well. So let me go ahead and fire the, uh, fire those off before we hit the top of uh, the hour as well. So you know, one, of, one of the questions that came through is re actually really related to what we were talking about as far as the, the trends that uh, are happening within the industry. This one actually talks about a trend that's happening across, uh, pr across the world. So it's focused on remote work. So the question is, with remote business being a huge factor in many businesses, how are you planning and how do you advise uh, uh, f facilities and organizations in fitness to be able to assess the situation and take that into consideration with their planning? Yeah, there's two things there. There's a, there's a proximity issue of our employees going to go back to the same places they were before from a density aspect. So if I have a club in a corporate environment, um, our is my audience coming back, right? And, and when are they coming back? Um, so then there's the, where do you put clubs based on where are the people? There's that kind of thing, which is kind of a macro thing that's still working itself out. But then there's the virtual piece, right? So if you go to activewellness.com and look at our at-home resources um, link, you'll see all the things we're doing for people virtually. You know, we have an equipment bundle that people can buy. We have um, videos that have been created on demand that show using that equipment as well as other equipment available around the house. We have live streaming. We have one-on-one -on -one personal training. You know, we have fitness tips, you know, so on and so on. So um, mm -hmm. thinking through the dynamic of virtual that we're no longer bound by our four walls, our brand is expanded. Um, and, you know, immediately we pivoted as an industry. We got some content out there. Virtually, now we're getting better at it and, and it will continue to be refined. And those that, that really figured out um, will um, will have some success with the virtual program. But there's two things to think about with virtual programming. One, is it a program within your current offering or is it a product that you're developing for the marketplace? And so there's a difference between having a program 
in your space and creating a brand new business unit, a brand new business product. And, and clubs will have, operators have to decide that. Awesome. And then changing gears, just because I'm jumping to another uh, person who sent in a, uh, a different question. Uh, this one's related to you know, uh, it looks like this organization is also in the corporate health and wellness uh, space. And so they're looking to bring on corporations as potential clients. And this one's about about sales, maybe marketing as well. So, you know, when, when approaching a company, what have you found to bring the most success in gaining them as a client? Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting question. Um, a lot of companies do RFPs, uh, requests for proposals. And, and so... You've got to follow their protocols, their level of communication. You can't just walk in and say, hey, I'd like to talk to somebody about it. So if there's an RFP process, you pretty much have to follow that because they have rules of consistency with regard to their vendor selection. Um, some companies want a partner for health promotion and wellness. You know, somebody that's going to help population health risk management, um, improve the productivity, reduce absenteeism, healthcare costs, all those things. But a lot of Companies want somebody to manage a fitness center as a tenant amenity, as an amenity for the property, for the campus. So do you report into human resources and wellness or do you report into facilities? You know, so who is the who is the who is the buyer? What problem are you trying to solve for the organization? Does the company want to have a, a tricked out fitness center so they can attract great talent or do they want to have a fitness center that generates unbelievable results from a wellness standpoint? So, you know, you got to understand the audience, what problem are you trying to solve and, um, and then, and then approach them, you know, accordingly. There's, um, there's different trade associations that, uh, corporations use. Um, there's, um, there's hero, um, there's different groups, you know, there's different conventions where these people are, where you can go and do booths and communicate one-on-one -on -one with them. But, um, but it depends on, uh, you know, do they have a current vendor? Is there an RFP process? What problem are you trying to solve? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's hard to just walk into to companies and go, hey, I've got a, a fitness management product. You know, you want to buy it? You know, so, so each one's yeah. kind of different, but uh, but a lot of them rely on the RFP. Yeah, that's huge. Got to gotta know who, who the potential customer is and what they're looking for before you start pitching. So that that's a, a, a definitely a big piece of advice for people to, to apply. And then maybe the last question then, Bill, before uh, before we uh, sign off, and one that I'm super curious about, you know, is uh, what do you, what do you think personally for you has been been the key to your your personal success? You know, there's there's other people who jo join the industry maybe around the same time, but they're not in the same place as you. And you know, I've, you're a humble guy. I know you're not going to say say it, but you are incredibly successful, and a lot of people admire what you've accomplished. You know, what what do you think has been the the key? to being able to achieve everything that you had? Uh, surround yourself with people better than you. Um, have fun. And don't give up. You know, set, set some goals and, and don't give up. Um, but, um, but you got to have fun. And, and you've got to, you've got to, uh, you've got to want to make that positive difference in other people's lives, you know, and, um, and happy members only come from happy associates. So if you want to have a good consumer product, you better have a good culture and focus on a great work environment for people to enjoy what they do and be fulfilled, you know? So, um, you can't, you can't, you can't do it backwards. You can't focus on the customer without focusing on, on your, your culture and your team. So I don't know if that's keep trying, man, just keep trying. I lost your volume, Caitlin. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Nope, still not. We'll give you another. We'll give you another three seconds. No, okay. It looks like the uh, the mic's uh, not working at the moment. But what I can say is, I'm sure he was going to say yes to it. It basically hit on uh, the question. Um, Bill, on I guess behalf of Kaylin, myself, but all the attendees, um, you know, the employees at, at Virch Gym, etc. We definitely want to thank you for 
uh, not only being here, but being able to share some awesome content uh, for everyone. So we appreciate it, Phil. It's always a pleasure to, to speak with you. Hopefully, we're going to have Ursa here coming up in another few months. Uh, hopefully, we'll be good to go on that and we'll be able to speak to each other uh, then as well. Derek, thank you. Kaylin, thank you. I appreciate you guys having me on. Have a great afternoon.